This video is sponsored by Polygon. High quality assets to make better renders faster. First things first, we need house reference. So Google some photos of houses and paste it into the free software PureRef. Rather than start Blender with an empty void, I like to add something to act as scale reference. So I appended in this correctly scaled human, which is CC0 and I've linked to in the description. Then you just start modeling the basic shape of the house, which in my case is two stories and L-shaped. To create the angled roof, First enable auto merge, then select two edges and merge them by pressing S to scale, then the X or Y axes, and then zero to smash them together. Then you select those faces, separate it to a new object and add a solidify modifier. Then to create the eaves, you select the outside edges, then double tap G to loop slide, and then press C to disable clamping, which will let you drag it past the point it started while retaining the edge. Now for the clapboard siding. While you could use a texture with displacement for that, it'll look way sharper and way more optimized if it's modeled. So we're gonna select the bottom edge of the house, duplicate it, move it to its own object, extrude it upwards, and then recalculate the normals to clear any mesh problems. Then to create that angled slope, we're gonna select the bottom row and press Alt S to scale it along its normal. And that is one clapboard that goes all the way around the house. So we just add an array modifier and a solidify modifier to finish the rest. But now the obvious problem, how do we fix it clipping through the roof? One way would be to apply everything and then manually cut it away with a knife, but that's tedious and I wanna keep things non-destructive. So instead, I'm gonna use the base house object as a Boolean. To do this, you select the siding, then add a Boolean modifier with intersect mode and fast approximation. Then you select the base house model as the Boolean object, which will make it act as an envelope, cropping anything that goes outside of it. All we need to do now is make the base house model slightly bigger than the siding, which you can do by going into edit mode and pressing Alt S. Then make sure the Boolean object's viewport display is set to wireframe and that it's disabled from rendering the outliner. And that is how you do non-destructive clapboard siding. Now for the windows and doors which you'd be a fool to model yourself because it's far too time consuming and finicky. Instead, use the Archimesh add-on which Blender comes with, which gives you easy parametric objects which you can add and then properties that can be altered after the fact. And what I like most about the Archimesh add-on is that each window and door comes with its own Boolean cutout. So to make that work with our siding, you select all the Boolean cutouts, move them to a new collection, then select the siding and add a new Boolean modifier. Set that to difference, fast approximation, and then the new collection. Now all the windows and doors will perfectly cut through the siding. And that's the hard bit. The rest of the house is really easy by comparison. So you put on some good music and start modeling any extra details you see in your reference. I added a concrete slab with a staircase that I also got from Archimesh. Then I added in some extruded cubes as banisters and railings, some angle brackets on the eaves, and a scrappy little plane that I extruded and then sheared around the corners of the roof to create the gutter. I also duplicated a board and then resized and rotated it to create trimmings around the windows and doors. And of course, add a bevel to everything since that helps catch the light and makes it look more realistic in your renders. Once you've finished modeling, high five yourself, grab a water, and then get ready to mess this thing up. For this next part, you'll need some good reference of abandoned buildings. Now you can source it for free from places like the Abandoned Porn subreddit, but I recommend going paid if you can afford it, like this pack that I found from Photobash. Not only will you get multiple angles of the same subject, but most importantly, it'll be high resolution, so you can zoom right in to see the details. Then copy and paste everything of relevance to your ever-expanding PureRef board. Here's a few tricks I've learned to make houses look old. Number one. Old houses are lumpy. You can create this effect by first adding multiple cuts along each plank to create squares. Then apply the array modifier and add a displacement modifier first in the stack. Then for the displacement texture, use a cloud texture at low strength, adjusting the size of the cloud till it matches the board warping from the reference. 
and you can do the same to the roof and the concrete. Just keep the strength low unless you want a house that looks like it's from Dr. Seuss. Number two, siding usually has discrete cuts which become more pronounced and more sloppy with age. So in edge select mode, select some loops and rip them by pressing V and moving them ever so slightly. Then on a few of them, press Control number pad plus to select the rest of the plank, then press R to rotate it ever so slightly. Number three, it wouldn't be abandoned without a broken window or two, which you can do by first adding in a reference photo of one into the scene and then adding a plane. Then edit that plane and use the knife tool to trace the broken glass all the way around until you're back at the start. Then delete the center face until you're left with the edges and then add a solidify modifier for some thickness. And since nobody wants to let in the zombies, duplicate some of the trim boards to make a quick barricade behind the glass. Number four, make it wonky. Railings aren't straight, poles aren't straight, nothing is straight, and some things are straight up missing. This is one of those rare moments where you can be creative with some storytelling, so have fun. And there it is, a house that looks like a rental. Now for the all important texturing which on an abandoned house like this will do 90% of the heavy lifting. There are two ways you could texture a building. One would be to paint directly onto one texture, much like Substance Painter. But this isn't ideal because you're then limited by the resolution of your texture. And if your object needs to change distance to the camera or say a character needs to walk right up to it in a game, then suddenly you can see the pixels. And even with an insanely large 8K texture map, a building like this will still look blurry. So the best method for texturing buildings is one that games have been using for years, painted masks with tiled textures. Tiled textures are great because they create free resolution. You can use a small texture, tile it a bunch, and it looks sharp even if you walk right up to it. And here you can see a side-by-side -side comparison of an 8K painted texture versus a 2K tile texture. The tile texture is not only sharper, but because it's smaller in resolution, it uses 14 times less memory. But tile textures also look really, really boring. So if you load in a second tile texture and then paint a mask to reveal different parts of each texture, you create something far more interesting. And if you do fancy stuff with the shaders, you can even make the blending look good. But you know what's better than blending two texture sets? Blending five. Rather than paint onto one black and white image, what games do instead is use the red, green, and blue channels as three independent masks. So your red paint becomes the blend between textures one and two, green blends in a third texture, Blue blends a fourth, and if you paint it into the alpha channel, you can even blend in a fifth texture. The resulting mask looks like hell, but when you separate the channels and put it through a shader, magic occurs. And this is how video games create cities that look realistic from afar, but still sharp up close. A key ingredient to this workflow is finding a set of textures that work well together, and it's why game studios will typically make their own, as they can ensure that they work cohesively together. So I've got the next best thing, it's Polygon. We spoke with some texture artists in the game industry to create a set of painted wood for this exact workflow. It's five texture sets in five stages of wear, paint only, slight chipping, heavy chipping, almost raw and raw. Extra attention was given to the chipping to ensure that it peels in relation to the wood grain as this happens in real life. And because the set is seamless and doesn't contain any panels or wood breaks, it can be used for everything from house siding to cabinetry. And while it comes as white, it comes with an ID mask so you could change the color to anything you wanted. For our house, we're gonna pick these three, the fully painted stage zero texture, the half painted stage two texture, and the raw wood stage four texture. And unless you're planning to put the camera closer than one meter to the wall, 2K is really all you need. Remember that every time you double the texture size, you are going to quadruple the memory at render. So while it's tempting to go big, keep it light, and not only will it render faster, but you'll be able to paint with less lag. Each of the texture sets come with a full set of PBR maps, which is good, but it's going to be really tedious if you had to load in all of the texture maps for three materials. So to make it easier, there's the Polygon Material Converter add-on, which you're going to download in the link below. 
This will import and set up the materials for you with one click. You just install the zip, then go to your material panel and you'll see the add-on appearing there. And then this empty field at the top here is where you're gonna to point to the folder location of your unzipped polygon files. Then you'll see all the materials appear beneath it. And with one click, it will load in all the maps for you with the correct normals and inverted gloss and apply it to the selected material. So we're gonna do it for all three materials, but we're actually gonna create a separate new material for our siding and add those materials to it. So to do this, go to the node editor and press shift A to add. And then under group, you'll see that the add-on has created a new node group for each material, which is basically just all the maps neatly loaded into one box, which makes it really easy to combine. Now, something you might not have ever wondered before is how do you actually combine multiple sets of PBR maps together? It's easy if you've got two textures, but what about eight? What about 12? Well, that would be a tedious process too, if the add-on didn't also give you this other node group, the PBR Mixer, which does exactly this. It simply combines two sets of PBR maps into one with a simple factor input at the top. You'll see this group appear in your backend anytime you add a material using the add-on. So we just need to connect them now. You're gonna put the cleanest material into the top input, which in this case is the stage zero solid paint version. Then we're gonna put the heavily worn version, in this case, stage four raw wood into the bottom. The chip paint version, leave that aside, we'll use that later. Then you take the outputs from that and plug it into the principled shader. And we won't see this on the mesh until we UV unwrap it, which is really easy to do. It's just U, smart UV project, and then in the UV image editor, just make sure you rotate all the planks so that they're horizontal and it should be fine. Then just add texture coordinate and mapping nodes to change the scale to whatever looks correct on the house. You should now see that if you change the factor value from zero to one, you're correctly blending between each texture set, which means that just like the mix RGB node, if we plugged a hand painted texture map into that factor input, we would control where each texture set is displayed. So let's do that. Add an image texture node and press new. And since this is just a mask, 2K should be more than enough resolution. And since we aren't rendering color, we wanna set the color space to non-color data and then connect this node to the factor input. Now, if we were to paint white, you'd see that it's working. What is black is one texture and what is white is another. But if you remember from before, we want to paint into the red, green, and blue channels separately and then use those channels to blend between different texture sets. So to do that, we want to add a separate RGB node, then take only the red channel and plug that into the factor input. Then if you paint with not white, but a completely red color, it will then paint only into the red channel and leaving the other two alone, which means this now functions exactly like that black and white mask, yet you still have these two other channels here to blend between two other texture sets or use it for any other hand painted effects that you want in your material setup. So if you started painting with this, you'd probably notice that while it works, it's pretty hard to create anything that looks realistic because the soft, gradual fading paint into wood is not how real paint peels. Real paint peeling is binary. It's either paint or it's either wood. It's not really anything in between. So normally the solution to this would be to just get fancy with the brushes. But remember that we're now painting into this low res texture mask. And just like before, if you wanted this to look sharp, you would have to increase the resolution to something crazy like 8K. So what to do? Well, the answer is one that might surprise you and a trick that I'm honestly surprised worked as well as it does, which I'm gonna share right after talking about Polygon. Whether you're making an interior, a building exterior, or a nature scene, Polygon has a range of textures, models, and HDRs for rapid scene building. Your render will only look as good as the quality of your assets, which is why customers like Oscar Wojnski trust Polygon to help them create jaw-dropping environments. Click the link in the description to get access to a range of free textures that you can start using in your work today. So the solution to our resolution problem, color burn. Color burn is that blending mode that you probably cycle through on your way to the more useful blend modes. And while it definitely doesn't get as much playtime, it's our saving grace for this exact problem. Because if we add a mix RGB node to our mask, set it to color burn, then any texture we put into the bottom here will affect our fall off areas of the brush stroke. So for this, we're gonna use that stage two texture peel. If you wanted to go the extra mile, you could actually use the red channel of the included ID mask and that way it'll look really sharp, but the roughness output is easier and it's good enough. Now it's working, but 
it's a little too subtle. So if you add a color ramp node after it with constant fall off and put the white somewhere in the middle there, you'll get that punchy binary look to our paint and wood. Now, if you were to paint with a low brush strength, you can see that with the color burn, it eats away into those gray areas, creating a really satisfying peel paint look. Not only does this method use the high resolution tile texture in our mask, but it's also much easier to paint with because you aren't constantly changing brush settings. And best of all, you can repeat the color burn step for any number of other textures you want to influence the mask. For example, in this case, you can see that while the paint peel looks cool, something feels off. It's almost like we're painting onto a flat wall rather than onto siding. And this is because paint peels primarily from prolonged exposure to the sun. And due to the angle of our planks, some parts of the planks are gonna be hidden in shadow and therefore receive less peeling. Now you could use a small brush to meticulously paint this in, but I found this process so tedious that I spent days trying to find a better solution. And I'm proud to say I did, and this is it. If you select the bottom edge loop of each plank, then go into vertex paint mode, then firstly invert it so it's black, then press vertex select mode so that you're only painting onto what we just selected, then press fill, it'll put this white fill only on those vertices we selected and create this gradient effect from the top of the plank down to the bottom. So if you now go back to the shader, duplicate that mix RGB color burn effect, then add in a vertex color node set to the vertex paint that we just created, now the lighter parts of that gradient will have more weight than the darker parts. And now our painting process is not only easier, but much more realistic. You get to use these big, simple brush strokes that automatically create detail in the right areas as you go. To complete our paint peeling effect, just add a bump node in between the final normal map, then connect our mask output to it through an invert node. Then you'll have bump on the paint so it actually looks layered on top. Our peel paint shader is now complete and we could start painting now, but actually it'd be easier if we just finish the shader to include the green and blue channel painting and then start. So essentially these channels give you options. They can be whatever you want them to be. Like maybe the story of your house is that it went through a fire. So you might want one of those channels to control a burn blackening of the color map. Or maybe you wanna create a mismatched paint color touch-up job, which is so common for old houses. Or maybe the roof is so damaged that it's leaking blackened water down the side of the building. So really just look at your reference and decide what extra details you need. For this scene, the house is in a wet Seattle environment. So I want one of the channels to paint moss. So I downloaded this moss texture from Polygon, used the add-on to bring it in like before, and then set the correct scale. I added it to the rest of the material by adding another PBR mixer after the wood and then connecting the factor input of that to the green channel. Then I duplicated one of those color burn mix nodes and then used the moss texture itself to drive it. Then finally, I fed it through a color ramp for extra contrast. And unlike the peel paint, moss is actually more likely to grow in the shadows. So I used another color burn driven by an invert of the vertex colors. But if you ever find that color burn is a little too strong of a blend mode, like in this case, overlay is a nice substitute that's a little smoother. Then for the blue channel, I wanted to create a wet mask to paint water leaking down the building. So I started by taking the blue channel and then putting it through a color ramp to boost its contrast. Then I put that into the factor value of a mix RGB node set to multiply. Then I put the final color map into the top and then that value at the bottom there drives how dark the wetness is. That's only influencing the color map though. So I then duplicated that mix RGB node and made it impact the roughness as well. And now the darker this value is, the sharper the reflection will be. And it creates quite a nice effect. And this is the final shader that we will now use for the painting. It is a lot of nodes, which I'm sure is overwhelming if you are new at texturing, but there's no vector math in here or complex equations to figure out. It's basically just taking channels and then using it to change different parts of the material. So with the hard part done, we can now be creative. You'll paint by swapping the fully red, green, or blue paint. But if it's set to the default blend mode of mix, then painting any new color will override the previous. So what you actually want is add, which allows the color to be added on top of other colors. And to remove the paint of that color, surprise, surprise, it's subtract. You wanna paint in material preview mode, but by default, there will probably be some lag. So there's two things you can do to improve it. 
One is to set the EV viewport to only show the diffuse color, so it's not trying to render bump and gloss and everything else while you're painting. And the second big thing is to disable the solidify modifier in the viewport, which will remove half the vertices and only paint on the front face of the mesh. And then your painting should basically be in real time. And while not necessary, if you have a graphics tablet, you will get faster results in less time. No question about it. Because of a little thing called pen pressure. Clicking your mouse is a binary on and off action, but using a stylus means that you're able to alter the intensity of each stroke. Now I have a Cintiq, which is nice if you can afford it, but honestly, any tablet will be better than a mouse. For years, I used a Wacom Bamboo, which was like $100 even back then new, and it was 100 times better than a mouse. So if you browse eBay or Facebook Marketplace today, you'll be able to find secondhand tablets that are cheaper than a mouse. To prepare for this tutorial, I probably textured the house 10 different times and each time was better than the last. So I definitely recommend playing around first just to familiarize yourself with how it works and then start again by filling the texture with black. So let's talk results. Poor texturing is almost always the result of playing it by ear. You don't wanna just paint what looks cool. Look at your reference and try to understand it. For example, paint on a house doesn't just peel randomly. It peels according to sun exposure and moisture. So one side of the house should have more peeling than the rest and there should be little to no peel paint under the eaves. Also, moisture will typically occur around windows, doors, and the corners of buildings because that's where watertight sealant is most likely to fail. These are two little things, but they'll make a big difference to the believability of your texturing. Moss will appear where it's dark and wet, so wherever water might splash or pool on the floor is a good place to put it. And I also like putting some under the windows so it looks like the water leaked from the sill above it. And leaks are more likely to appear beneath structural damage, but honestly, it can appear everywhere. I replayed the Seattle scenes from The Last of Us while working on this, and I realized that almost every building had a leak texture but it still looked plausible because of course, rain can go sideways and hit the side of the house. And while reference is important, you also need to know when to simplify and exaggerate. If you compare game texturing to real life reference, you're immediately struck by how much more detail is in real photos, but this is deliberate to make it more readable. My first texturing attempt looks straight up noisy because I tried to add all the detail from a photo and it was just too much for the eye to understand. So simplify and exaggerate. Create some big sections of peeled paint, then some medium-sized sections, and a few smaller details here and there. This will let your eye explore the building without feeling exhausted from all the chaos. And by the way, if you find that your brush feels too hard, remember that the color burn technique works in the mid values. So you need to use a lower brush strength, and then you'll get all that texture detail start to come in. For the balcony and window frames, first merge them, unwrap them, then use the same siding material, but make it its own material copy so that you can then use a new 1K mask texture to paint it separately. For the house foundation, I used this brick texture for all the sides, desaturated it and darkened it, and then this concrete texture for the top. We want the same moss leaks from the siding, but copying all those nodes across would be tedious. So instead, just group the moss and the leaks into a node group, then add that node group to the new material and it'd be much easier to add in. Then create a brand new 1K mask texture and do the painting just like before. Moss at the bottom, leaks from the top. Then for the roof, I used this new texture set from Polygon, which just like the siding was designed to go together. I used only the clean and fully mossy versions, which I blended between with the red channel. And for the green channel, I used that to blend in this photo scanned leaf flooring. If you use a tiny brush with some jittering, you can then paint in the appearance of smaller leaves scattered around the roof. And I actually found this pretty fun to paint with. You make the leaves gather where they logically would, like down the ridges, around the gutters, and then you paint the moss texture underneath that. Then to make the roof appear less flat, you wanna use displacement. So take the displacement output, put it through a displacement node, then turn on true displacement for the material. Then last in your modifier stack, add a subsurf modifier with adaptive and the leaves will then pop off the roof. And a final optional step is adding Ivy. It's a bit beyond the scope of this tutorial, but just quickly, I use the Ivy Generator add-on, but instead of the terrible leaves that it comes with, I used this new Leaf Atlas from Polygon, which was modeled onto new objects, then scattered across the Ivy stem with geometry nodes. 
It's a bit of extra work, but it does look good. So if you want to copy the nodes, here they are. And we did it. The rest of the scene is up to you. But in this case, this Seattle Last of Us inspired scene, it was trees, plants, a hydrant, rubbish. They were all collected from various asset libraries and then used as set dressing across the scene to create the final animation. Big thanks to two of my staff, Pavo Pechizewski for creating the artwork and Bill Barber for breaking down the workflow. Guys, if you enjoyed the video, click like and subscribe, and then check out some of my other scene workflow videos which are on the screen right now. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in a future video.